started. As everybody have, we're starting our new quarter this morning, so we've got our new foundations book for the study of Hebrews. And here in just a second, if you don't have one, we'll make sure that Barry can get you a copy. I'm um, going to let Mike get a count for our daily Bible readers. If you're a daily Bible reader, if you'll raise your hand, let Mike get a count of that. We'll do that first. I see some hands held high. That's good. Thank you, Mike. And Mike, do you care to tell Barry if he's got some books? I'm sure we might need somebody that's got some books this morning. If you, uh, if you don't have one of the new quarterlies this morning, if you'll raise your hand, I think Barry's gathering up some for us right now. We'd like to make sure you get a copy of one of those. He's just being a gentleman there and clearing the door. When you do get your quarterlies, we're going to be lesson one. I think it's on page number one. And if you've got your Bibles with you, we're, we're going to be starting our study in Hebrews in Hebrews chapter one. We'll be starting there in just a second. Barry, if you don't mind, Barry Cahoon, would you mind leading us in a word of prayer before we start this morning? Most gracious, ever-loving Father, be with us now as we open thy book and read from thy word. Holy Father, help it to change our hearts and our minds. Help us to obey thee each and every day. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Barry. Well, we had just completed, um, I think everybody would agree, a very great quarter of study uh, from from a different book, um, kind of giving us uh, some emphasis on the role of the church and the duties and the responsibilities of us as Christians and our roles inside the church. Um, very pleased with that quarter of study. Felt like we had a lot of good discussion, um, very engaging studies that we had. And um, if I'm not speaking out of turn, I think for next quarter, we, where we had had so much study in the book of Acts over the past year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we may try to do that one more time next quarter, and uh, hopefully you all enjoyed that. It felt like it went, all the teachers did a fantastic job, a lot of good discussion. I hope we can continue to have some good discussion because that makes the classes seem a little bit more, there's more, more to get out of these, and I'm going to try my best to offer up some uh, room for discussion. I'm, I'm particularly excited about this study, the book of Hebrews. We're going to go into it a little bit later. It's a pretty versatile book. Um, you will probably recognize a lot of pieces of scriptures that you'll hear in many sermons, many lessons. Um, but the idea behind uh, how the book was written, why it was written, um, we'll talk about who or we don't know exactly who wrote the book. A lot of good things that we're going to talk about um, to kick off this study in the book of Hebrews. Um, before we get started, as a chance for some discussion a little bit, I was just curious, has anybody got any uh, when you think of, of Hebrews, I know there's a few things that will definitely come to mind, but when you think of the book of Hebrews, what are some things from this, from this book that maybe come to mind first, the most prevalent thoughts that you have about the book of Hebrews? Anybody have any comments? Better. Better? Oh, the New, oh, the, the New Testament compared to the Old Testament, exactly. Um, so much good stuff in 13 short chapters. Um, we do talk about, or it, it, the Hebrew writer does talk about the new covenant that's brought by Jesus compared to the old covenant. We're going to talk about the fact that the book of Hebrews, um, as far as we can tell, was written to the Hebrew Christians in the first century, uh, Christians who probably had grown up with a long, you know, a long history, a long tradition of the, of the Jewish faith, um, and how that kind of applies of kind of trying to turn over to the new covenant compared to the old covenant. Um, the, the, the position that Jesus played in all this, raising Jesus up above, above anything else, uh, and we're going to talk about specifically about that today in chapter 1. But that's a very good point, R.W. Anybody got any other comments about what you think about when you hear the book of Hebrews? Uh, 
Definitely. Definitely. And to me, that's kind of an argument against uh, Yes. We all realize that the Old Testament does still serve a purpose for us as uh, New Testament Christians. We do understand a lot about why the New Testament was put in place and replaced in the Old Testament. Um, the fact that the, the writer of Hebrews has a pretty good knowledge and a pretty good grasp over the Old Scriptures, he's able to tell us a lot of things later in the, in the next few lessons we're going to we're all probably familiar with a piece of scripture that talks about the blood of bulls and goats and how that was something of the past in the old law about how the emphasis on Jesus and the, play, and the, the role that he played to die for our sins is that one and final sacrifice so that we don't have to continually uh, offer up sacrifices to God as they did in the Old Testament. These are, the book of Hebrews hits upon that in such a hard-hitting way and why it's written this way is something that I think I'm going to try to point out today, and if we can kind of keep that in the back of our mind as we're going through each of the chapters or each of the lessons that we have over the next quarter. Um, the, compared to the last quarter, the study that we had, we're all, we, we all have a fascination about what we want to do to strengthen the Lord's church. When we come back uh, to a study of the, of the Bible and we pick out a certain book, uh, as Christians, we have a lot of faith in the Scriptures and it's best that we have as good of understanding as we can of that. And I have learned as an adult compared to how when I was younger, how I would just pick up and read the Bible. Sometimes if you're just picking up and reading, it's kind of hard to comprehend the depth that the Bible has. This book of Hebrews, for example, there's a lot of things. If we can understand some background on what is being written, why it's being written, I think it can help. I know for me, myself, as I've learned that, as an adult, and I try to get my hands on some um, commentaries or some things to help me understand fuller, this all makes a lot more sense, and hopefully we can kind of draw that out uh, in this quarter of study. Um, one more. Does anybody else have anything about they think about in the book of Hebrews to study? I know that, uh, I know that Brother Edwards has mentioned before uh, Joseph Schumann. Uh, he, my family also knew Joseph. And one thing, Joseph was a Jew, mm -hmm. and he was converted. specifically points to uh, the Jews and trying to get them to accept Christ. That, that was a perfect comment. That kicks me right off into where I want to start. It's almost like we talked beforehand for me to pick you out yeah, and do that. I'll, I'll, I'll we didn't. Later. We didn't, but it seems like it. Barry, that is a great comment. Um, and I'm going to kind of <laughs> directly from that. The common theme, and I've wrote this up at the top of the first page for my notes, uh, the theme that you'll see here, that it appears that the writer of Hebrews uh, is encouraging the Jewish Christians not to lose their faith or turn away from Christianity. And what I mean by that is when we talk about the first century, um, the Gentiles being basically anybody else who was not of the Jewish faith, they didn't have the background that the Jews had. Um, the Jews of this time especially and for thousands of years uh, had such uh, a strong background of their faith and traditions. Um, we talk about in the first century the, specifically the Pharisees and the Sadducees, um, all the scribes. They, you know, even in the times where they were trying to test Jesus, they had ulterior motives. They were so strong and to hold and firm what they were always taught, what their grandfathers, their forefathers we're going to talk about the patriarchs of the Old Testament. There was such a strong hold to that that um, I could imagine that it was hard for those, even those Jews that had decided to put their faith uh, in Jesus and become a New Testament Christian, or what they didn't realize is that at that time they were becoming New Testament Christians. There were a lot of things that was hard for them to turn their back on. And I think about the book of uh, Galatians, probably other, other books, but... Um, we had a study on Galatians just a year or two ago. Can anybody remember the difficulty that Paul had in talking to the new Christian test, or the new the, the Christian Jews of that time that they were probably newly converted? 
Can anybody remember some of the difficulty that Paul had and some of the difficulty that the Jews were facing at that time? The Jews that had recently converted to become Christians were still trying to hold on to some of the traditions that they had as Jews and apply it to the Christian faith. So if they came up to a Gentile who was also newly converted, they were basically trying to say, hey, you do still need to be circumcised or you do still need to do these things that was written in the old law because that's what they knew and they just kind of assumed. I, I don't know of the difficulty that they really faced, but I could imagine they just had a hard time, just like Julie pointed out, they had a hard time closing the book to use a phrase on the Old Testament and focusing solely on the new, the new covenant, the new law given to us through Jesus, by God, but through Jesus. Um, the Hebrew writer, we ref you probably hear that a lot um, because we don't really know exactly. This is one of, or maybe the only book in the New Testament, not the only book in the Bible, but the only book in the New Testament where we don't exactly know who the writer is. Now, I have learned, as I said earlier, that Learning a lot of background on these things kind of helps me understand some things a lot better. And I guess it would be nice to know exactly who wrote the book of Hebrews. This is an epistle uh, or a letter that was written directly to somebody, just like all the epistles written by Paul, uh, John, and Peter, all the epistles that we have in the New Testament. But this one is a little different. Um, first of all, we can. Uh, a lot of Bible scholars over the years have kind of tried to give their opinions, their take on who wrote the book. Um, for a long time, and probably even today, there's a lot of people that still think that Paul probably wrote the book of Hebrews. Um, there's even, uh, the structure may even kind of be similar to some of the other epistles that Paul wrote. Uh, when we get into the latter chapters, uh, just like the book of Romans, for example, Paul when, he Paul, when he penned the book of Romans, there's a lot of build and a lot of instruction and some things in the, the first half or the first part of it, and then when we start getting to the end of the book or the end of the letter, we start seeing some practical uses, and we see that in the book of Hebrews. But then there's some Bible scholars that will tell us that the, um, the typical use of Paul's Greek uh, was a little bit more scatological, and this was a little bit more concise, and, and Roland don't know exactly what that means. That's just something I read and a reason why they think that Paul may not have wrote the book. But there's others who think that maybe one of Paul's um, close apprentices or, or brothers in the faith possibly could have, do, uh, could, have, could have written the book, and we think that because we get to chapter 13, we're going to read the fact that uh, our brother Timothy is mentioned. So there's some that think that Barnabas or Silas possibly, Apollos, or maybe even Luke could have penned, the Bible, penned this book. But aside from that, it probably really doesn't matter. We're not focusing. Uh, a lot of times it's great if we do know who wrote the book, but in this particular case, um, that's something that nobody has really... Um, conclusively kind of said that, yeah, this is definitely who wrote it, and it really probably doesn't matter to us. Uh, when, not exactly sure when. Uh, there's, not, there's not a lot of things other than the fact that we know that uh, it was sometime after the, uh, the crucifixion of Jesus, and there's some things mentioned, um, Timothy, for example, so we know that there's a certain time frame after the death of Jesus and Paul and his, um, his uh, uh journeys and things like that that we could probably pin a time, but maybe even the when doesn't really matter. To whom and why are probably the more important parts that we want to focus on for the book of Hebrews. Um, the book is titled Hebrews. My, my Bible actually says uh, a, an epistle to the Hebrews, which these were probably given titles given well after the book was written. But just like Barry says, it was, it appears to be a letter that was written directly to the Hebrews in the first century. And the why as I said before, the theme, it's encouraging Jewish Christians not to turn their back away from their newfound faith. Um, there's even a comment that I, uh, the, the author of our quarterly had kind of put in here that I made note of. Um, to return to Judaism was to reject Jesus. To reject Jesus was to reject his salvation. And if we think about that, that's a pretty strong comment. And... The fact that I said that the book of Hebrews is pretty versatile is because even though this book was written to Hebrews that were newly found Christians in the first century, the writer is trying his best to emphasize how important Jesus is, the role that Jesus played, what our salvation means, and the fact that we can't really look back on the Old Testament. But even to us today uh, in the 21st century, uh, as, as Christians, it's easy for us to turn back to the ways of the world or we may find somebody else that is 
part of a denomination that's going to try to test our faith in the Lord's church. It could be any number of things. But what we read in the book of Hebrews can apply just as strong to that today as it did 2,000 years ago to the Hebrews. Uh, so my introduction was probably a little longer than I meant for it to be, but I want to kind of keep that thought in the back of, back of our heads as we're studying through uh, Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. If you're with me on, uh, in the quarterly or maybe even the first uh, chapter of Hebrews, I'm going to take the passage that we have. We're going to read through those real quick. Starting with verse 1 of chapter 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to who, which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministries a flame of fire? But to, his, but to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, a scepter of righteousness and the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a, co a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed." But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Um, jumping into this, uh, I'm going to kind of break down just a little bit of, um, of the scriptures. Um, we're talking a little bit this morning about um, Jesus, and, and in a good part of this first chapter here, Jesus in comparison to the angels, for an example. Um, I think the Hebrew writer, because if, if you think of, if you're writing a letter to the Hebrews, and the Hebrews are still very much hooked to the Old Testament, the, the Mosaic Law, everything that they know from the Old Testament, um, might be kind of easier to understand why the writer is trying to size things up the way that he is. We're going to, in my mind, I'm thinking of a hierarchy here, and actually in later chapters we'll kind of compare, right here Jesus is, being compared to the angels. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, we're going to talk in a few chapters about the fact of comparing Jesus to, um, to Moses and Aaron and, and the, the descendants of Moses and Aaron, priests, um, prophets. And, and Barry, you made a comment just a while ago that I had this thought too. Um, I've never thought of it in that way, but if you're talking to someone in today's world, that is maybe a person uh, that is a Jewish person that maybe grew up with the Jewish faith. Uh, the book of Hebrews definitely would be a great place to begin a study with that person. <coughs> I don't know if this applies. I'm pretty sure it doesn't apply to all Jewish people today. But I, I, had, I had read somewhere um, that I, I believe that many Jewish people today would admit that they believe that, Jew, that Jesus was a real person who lived at the time as he's written about in the Bible. But they don't refer to him as the Son of God. They don't think that he was the Messiah that was prophesied all through the Old Testament. They don't believe that Jesus is that person. And actually, they, they think of him more as one of the prophets. Uh, I actually have read some quotes that were from Jewish people that believe that Jesus was, he was just one of the prophets. He definitely had a lot of good things to say, but uh, they still believe that he was wrong in a lot of things because ultimately they don't believe that he died for the sins of everyone in the world. Even if Paul is talking to us about salvation is for everyone, the Jew first and the, Gen and the Greek, um, salvation is for everyone, uh, they appear to not believe about that part. And if we are talking about where we could begin the book of Hebrews, if we can kind of point out these things, um, like I said, Barry, I'd never really thought about that, but this would definitely be a great place to start New Testament-wise. Um, why this book, I guess I'm stepping a little bit out of turn, but I've made a comment here where we were talking about how this epistle might be different than the other epistles in the New Testament. 
First of all, we don't have the typical uh, introduction or the greeting that we do throughout most of the New Testament. Um, just the pattern that we seem to see a lot of times is grace be to you or greetings uh, by the, the, the disciple Paul or however it's written. They usually tell who it is and who they're writing the letter to. Uh, verse 1 of chapter 1 of Hebrews basically just kicks right off into a discussion. Um, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the Father by the prophets, has in this last day spoken to us by his Son. Um, but even for an introduction, that's probably a very strong way to start it out, especially for someone who is trying to explain to Jewish people the introduction of Jesus. Uh, what does this first verse mean to you guys? God, who at various times spoke, spoke in the past to the fathers by the prophets, has in the last days spoken to us by his son. How did God speak to people in the Old Testament? And there's different periods of the Old Testament. Directly. Directly. That's exactly right. Uh, early on, when we're thinking about uh, Abraham, uh, Jacob, he didn't necessarily talk to, just like we were talking about our, our uh, study in the book of Exodus when, you know, Moses was leading the people out of, uh, out of Egypt. He didn't talk directly to all the people at that, point, at that particular point. He was talking to Moses, didn't necessarily even talk to Aaron. Well, maybe he talked to Moses and Aaron at the same time. I'm thinking back and not, not exactly sure about that. But early on, God spoke directly to the patriarchs, the heads of the families, um, and then when we get to uh, some other, other points in the Bible, we get to Moses on Mount Sinai. The law is given. Of course, God is speaking directly to Moses at that time. Um, but the, um, the law is basically, and this is going to kind of come into our study here in just a second, but how was the law delivered to Moses? Anybody remember? There was something that I read that said that some of the laws, maybe not all the laws, but some of the laws were delivered to uh, Moses by, the, by an angel. So the, there's, there's a lot of emphasis on how angels were delivering some certain things too, but God spoke directly to the point I was trying to make earlier, I'm sorry, uh, was God did speak directly to people directly. Um, he also spoke through the prophets to certain, later on as we you know, have the kingdoms of, of Israel and, and Judah, um, there's a lot of work by the prophets that are given to us. Uh, the author here tells us basically uh, men like Nathan, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, and more, you know, they, they had a strong voice in their prophecy. We have a lot of prophecy about the coming Messiah. Um, but that was some of the ways that God, God spoke to people in the Old Testament, directly or by the prophets or by um, through the angels. And then when we get to everything we have in the New Testament, um, there's a certain period of time between Malachi and the book of Matthew that things kind of change and we don't have God talking, speaking directly to us. We have the word spoken to us in the New Testament by whom? Who delivers the gospel? Who delivers everything to us in the New Testament before the apostles take place? Holy the Holy Spirit. Jesus, through God the Son, um, any of the... Any of the uh, Gospels that you'll read, Jesus reminds us many times that it is not I who am saying this to you. It's me delivering it through the Father. Um, God uses the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus. He speaks through the apostles, through the Holy Spirit, to deliver things without he himself having to talk to us directly. So as the beginning of this says, God who used to or at various times spoke, spoke to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by, him, by his son. And I can only imagine that in these last days probably means maybe the last 30, 40, 50 years, wherever we're at in this point that the book of Hebrews is written. Um, but he refers to the son as he whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds. We're gonna, we see here that there's a lot of emphasis um, the author of our commentary basically says the book of Hebrews exalts Jesus. And he definitely does in this first chapter, second and third chapter, we're going to see that. Um, but if we're looking at this from the point of view of a Jewish person who is now uh, a, a, a Christian, they may understand they've heard some things about Jesus. They're heard, they've heard the gospel being preached to them. 
but maybe they still don't understand how important Jesus was. So the Hebrew writer is definitely making sure they understand how important he was. Verse 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He himself, he had by himself purged our sins. Now we do know that Jesus was the Son of God. God sent him here um, to die for us, but... There was no use of, of angels that were helping Jesus um, on the cross. Uh, that, I don't want to mis, misspeak. Our salvation was given to us through the sacrifice of Jesus alone. Jesus didn't have other earthly people that was helping him do that. Jesus alone died and suffered on the cross for the remission of our sins. Um, he had by himself purged our sins. He had sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Continuing on with verse 4, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He has become so much better than the angels. What is the Hebrew writer doing here? He's making a comparison between the old law and the new law. As the old law was given to the angels, <coughs> the new law was given through his son. Exactly, Richard. We need, I mean, I, we today need that. I don't know if we need it today. We hopefully have a, an understanding of Jesus being, of all earthly things from the spiritual nature, from, from an earthly perspective, Jesus on high came to earth. He would be above anything here on earth. The power of God given to Jesus on earth is definitely by far the highest thing. Uh, if we are making a list or a hierarchy uh, of, of man and angels, Jesus obviously needs to be at the top of that. And that's the comparison that he's trying to make here. To the Jews, he wants them to understand that Jesus is far more important than the angels. Um, I made a comment here, and I wonder if maybe there might have been a little bit of uh, confusion to the Jews at that time. If we turn just one chapter over, wow, I had no idea I was that far behind. Let's, let's end on this part right here. Um, on Hebrews chapter 2, if we go over just one chapter, uh, and we read verse 9. I would like to maybe just, maybe this is a good place to end with a little bit of discussion. Uh, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the su suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Is this a, a conflict, or, or is this conflicting ideas, saying that Jesus is more important than the angels, and then one chapter over it's saying that Jesus was made a little lower than the angels? What's some thoughts on that? Exactly. Because he couldn't taste death. Angels don't taste death. Exactly. You know, but for, G and for him to be the example that God needed to be, he had to be us. <coughs> it's kind of like God being, uh, I'm going to let part of me endure what you endure. Mm -hmm. Just so that Barry, you can't gripe and complain because you tell me that, you know, you didn't pass. God, you didn't suffer like I did. No, I'm going to suffer with you in the form that you're in to show that I love you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, but yeah, the made a little lower than angels, we're lower than angels. Mm -hmm. As humans, we are. And Jesus was made in form like us. From an earthly perspective, Jesus was made lower than the angels because there's no way he could have suffered or endured pain or the emotions. Jesus went through everything that we would go through, yet came out of it sinless and perfect. Um, that's a testament to how, how we put Jesus above high, the things that he did. Now, he was, as it's pointed out in Hebrews, he was made to sit at the right hand of, of God. So from an earthly perspective, he was made lower than the angels, but only because Jesus... What if Jesus was not made to suffer? What if Jesus didn't die and, and die that cruel death? Would, our, would, it, would it mean as much to us? That's just a thought I've had before. Would that mean as much to us if Jesus didn't suffer? Have you ever thought about that? I think it would take the magnification of how important that is down quite a bit. I think God obviously felt that it was important for us because we can only understand things from a worldly perspective. We try our best as Christians each day to see things on the spiritual realm. Um, if you've ever tried to look at things from why did God do this, why did God do that, I don't think any of us were created to be able to understand, really. We can kind of put it in our own point of view or our own perspective, but... Um, and this is just my opinion. This is not a study on how the Hebrew writer feels about it. But to me, it, it means quite a bit that Jesus was made to suffer. That should mean a whole lot more to what salvation means to us. It 
Brother Edward mentioned this morning, David penned this in Psalm verse 22, but on the cross he referred to what David wrote. Why have you forsaken me? God, he knew that God hadn't forsaken him, but he was definitely feeling some serious pain at that point in time. And that was for each and every one of us. And we have a responsibility. Hopefully we'll go through further study. I appreciate you guys having patience with me and the comments.